Good afternoon, and welcome to Baldwin-Wallace College. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Saul Kaplan is founder and chief catalyst of the Business Innovation Factory. Saul started Business Innovation Factory in 2005 with a mission to enable collaborative innovation. The nonprofit is creating a real-world laboratory for innovation, innovators to explore and test new business models and system level solutions in areas of high social importance, including healthcare, education, entrepreneurship, and energy independence. Saul previously served as executive director of the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation and as the executive counselor to the governor on economic and community development. He created Rhode Island's unique innovation at scale economic development strategy aimed at increasing the state's capacity to grow and support an innovation economy, including an effort to turn the state's compact geography and close-knit public and private sector networks into a competitive advantage. Prior to his state leadership role in economic development, Saul served as a senior strategy partner in Accenture's health and life science practice and worked broadly throughout the pharmaceutical medical products and biotechnology uh, technology industry. He also spent eight years working for the pharmaceutical division of Eli Lilly and Company as a marketing plans manager and assisted in developing the launch strategy and successful introduction of Prozac into the U.S. market. Saul is going to discuss business model innovation as the new strategic imperative for the private and public sectors. Please welcome Saul Kaplan. Thank you. Good afternoon. I know I'm on a college campus because the first two rows are uh, empty. That's that's how you know, right? Nobody wants to uh, move up to the to the to the front seat. So, well, uh, first, uh, let me thank uh, Deb Mills Schofield uh, for uh, inviting me to to spend a few days uh, here in Cleveland. Uh, if uh, if you do only one thing today, if you don't know Deb. Uh, you need to. Uh, that's the one thing you should do. It's an incredible, incredible connector uh, and really uh, appreciates the value of uh, doing what I call uh, forcing and making uh, random connections and collisions amongst unusual suspects. And you're going to hear me talk about uh, innovation uh, and the need to do that, that we need to get out of our silos uh, and get into uncomfortable places where we can interact with uh, and collide with more unusual suspects. We're good at connecting with the usual suspects, uh, but innovation is all about the gray areas between us, and I'm going to talk uh, a, a lot about that. So, Deb, thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, those of you uh, here from Cleveland, I'll definitely need to know Deb. Linda, thank you uh, for, for hosting me here. Uh, it's been a great day here at uh, Baldwin Wallace. I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, with the interest in innovation uh, and the conversation that we've had uh, so far uh, today. Uh, I'm convinced uh, that if we can just connect the dots between uh, like-minded innovation junkies, uh, that we can change the world. And it's rooms like this. Uh, I'm presuming you're here because you're interested in the topic of uh, innovation uh, and that uh, you, like me, uh, are an innovation junkie uh, because you're wired to think that there's always a better way. I know that as an innovation junkie that no matter what, I always think there's a better way. From small little things like traffic in the morning, you know, when I'm driving here thinking that there must be a better way to avoid that accident or that traffic uh, incident. I mean, don't we have the technology today where that information uh, can be there in time when I need it? You know, and little things like that to big things like why aren't we fixing our public school system? And when we drive by our public schools, what, how did we let that happen in this country? And it makes you want to cry. Uh, innovation junkies you know, are equally passionate about both of those extremes, right? The every little thing making it better and passionate about trying to make the big things uh, better uh, as well. Uh, I've always said it's a blessing and a curse uh, to be an innovator. It's a blessing because you always think there is a better way and you're constantly focused on how you can create 
a better way, to improve the lives of the people around you and your family and your friends. Uh, it's also a curse uh, for the same reason, because no you're never done. Right? There's always a better way. So whatever you did today, there's a better way tomorrow. So it's a curse in that right, you're never satisfied. Right? And it's very anxiety provoking. Uh, you know, there's a lot of vulnerability uh, to being uh, an innovator. Uh, I'm the founder and chief catalyst uh, of a nonprofit I founded called the Business Innovation Factory. Uh, how many of you have had the opportunity to create your own title? Anybody? Yeah, if you ever do, I highly recommend it. Uh, and uh, creating your own title uh, is uh, a cool thing to do because you can really shape your own platform uh, and it really sends a strong signal both to yourself in terms of what your role is and to others around you that you interact with uh, and that you work with. So I call myself the chief catalyst because I believe that there's no higher role for any leader I mean, I don't care whether you're a leader you know, in a company, a leader in a nonprofit, a leader within your community, within your school. Uh, there's no higher role uh, for a leader to play uh, than to be a catalyst. Now, I remember uh, many moons ago uh, my high school chemistry and college chemistry. Uh, and what I like about the idea of being a catalyst uh, that I remember from chemistry uh, is that a catalyst is the enzyme that actually gets the reaction started, right? It gets the reaction started. I also remember uh, that once it gets the reaction started, it gets out of the way. A catalyst gets out of the way and lets that reaction continue on. And that's what leaders ought to do, right? They ought to get a reaction started, and then they, they ought to motivate uh, people around them uh, to continue to do incredible work, to in do, apply incredible creativity to get things done, and leaders should get out of the way and let it happen. The third thing I like about the idea of being a catalyst is I also remember that the catalyst never gets used up in the reaction if, you, if, you, if you've taken, taken chemistry. It actually doesn't get used up, and I like that idea of being in an innovation mix and changing things and making things better, uh, starting the reaction, getting out of the way, and not getting used up in the process so you can live to catalyze uh, another reaction. So that's, that's why I call myself uh, the chief catalyst. Let me grab my, um, my clicker here. I'm going to talk about uh, business model innovation, and I'll do some definitions here uh, in a little bit uh, to, uh, to give you a sense of that. But I want to frame our discussion uh, this afternoon with a couple of guiding questions you know, that I want uh, you, you to think about. Right? One, what is your organization's current business model? And if it's not an organization, if you're a student, I believe, and you'll hear me make the point, that business models aren't just for organizations, that individuals have business models too. Uh, so I would ask you to think about this, uh, and I'll give you the definitions here in a little bit as I go through the, the competition, but as, as a framing question, you know, what is your current business model? I mean, can you articulate it? Uh, can you describe, can you tell me the story about what your business model is? Whether you're an individual, an organization, part of a community, you know, can you describe that? Number two, it's, is it sustainable? Is the business model that you live and work in today is it a sustainable business model? How much longer do you think it's going to last? Do you think you need to invent a new one? And then the third one is a very important premise for me. Right? It's kind of a leading set of questions, because implied in that is my bias to say that business models don't last as long as they used to, and that you're going to need to learn how to do R&D for new business models. The same way we do R&D today for new technologies and new products, are you doing R&D for new business models? Again, if you're an individual, right, translate that to how you reinvent yourself. Right? Uh, do you have the capacity to reinvent yourself so that you can continually grow and be relevant to the world that's changing much more rapidly you know, than it ever changed before. Same thing is true for organizations. So I'm going to come back to these three guiding questions as I go through the presentation. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share a personal story uh, with you. I'm a huge believer in the power of storytelling. I think there's no more important tool 
for an innovator than the ability to share stories. I mean, think about it, right? What we really get emotionally attached to and what we learn the most from are stories. I mean, that's how we learn. But yet, what do we do? You know, we share boring PowerPoint presentations, right, and expect that people are going to learn from that. Right? as opposed to sharing a story that you can relate to, that you can put yourself into and see whether that's a narrative or a story that, that you can do. I think we have to learn how to be better storytellers. Individuals need to do it. Organizations and communities need to do it. Need to get much better at how to share stories, how to package them, how to communicate them, how to use new communication channels uh, in order to share your story. So I, I'm going to try uh, one out on you, and, and it's mine. So I'm going to tell you the story of the accidental bureaucrat. Uh, this is a picture that some wise guys uh, in my office uh, put together. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the closest I'm ever going to get to Kathleen Turner and, uh, and Gina Davis. Uh, that's, that, that's pretty certain. Uh, but a lot of what I'm going to share with you today in terms of innovation and new business models is really the result of a perspective change that I got uh, as an accidental bureaucrat, where I had the opportunity late in my career uh, to serve uh, in state government. And I never thought that uh, I would work in government. In fact, I had avoided government like the plague uh, through my entire career, which was in the private sector, which I'll share a little bit uh, about. So if you had asked me early in my career, would I ever work in government, I would have immediately, I wouldn't have uh, even flinched, I would have immediately said to you, there's no way that I would ever work in government. And yet it came to pass where uh, I had the opportunity uh, to, to work in government, and it was an amazing, amazing perspective changer for me. Because for the first time in my career and in my life, I got to think about innovation, not through the lens of a corporation, which I'll, I'll share with you in a minute, I did for a lot of years. But I got to think about innovation through the lens of a community, through, through the lens of a community. And it is a very, very different perspective. Uh, and it was very eye-opening for me. And it shaped a lot of my perspectives and my points of view on innovation and what it means and how important it is to leverage innovation thinking and process uh, in order to change the world, in order to fix both the small things I talked about as well as some of the larger things you know, like healthcare and education and energy. These are all uh, challenges that we live with every day. And I'm, I'm convinced that looking at those things through the lens of the community is the platform that we all need in, in order to improve these things. And I'll, I'll share with you why. Uh, the way I got to this was a very long you know, private sector career. Uh, I I have a training in science. I studied pharmacy uh, as an undergraduate, and my graduate degree is in the strategic management of technology. I've always uh, loved technology and thinking about how technology diffuses in the marketplace. And I'm a marketing guy at heart, so I like to think that we can influence the patterns of how technology diffuses in the market. And that's been a constant theme throughout my entire career. Uh, as Linda said, I started uh, in industry, so I worked directly uh, in industry, in the pharmaceutical industry. I worked for Eli Lilly and Company, uh, one of the larger uh, companies. Uh, I had uh, an incredible experience. Uh, I did a lot of stuff, but I, the, the claim to fame was working on the US introduction of a product called Prozac. Uh, which I usually say uh, was successful despite our efforts. Uh, it was an incredible opportunity as a marketing person to work on that product. Uh, I, I like to think we had a little something to do with, with influencing the way we think about affective disorders and depression and mental illness in this country. I mean, at the time that I was working on that, we didn't even talk about that subject. You know, you know there, we had an aunt who had a nervous breakdown, you know, and that was the most that you would say. I mean, think how far we've come from those days in terms of recognizing uh, mental illness as a real disease that can be treated uh, and the progress that we've made at improving the lives of, of people with mental illness. Well, working on Prozac was at the early stages of that. 
all right, because we were beginning to change the conversation and we had the opportunity uh, to put a very interesting technology into the U.S. marketplace uh, that completely changed the market. So what I took away from my industry, my direct industry experience, was this idea of what I call market making versus share taking. Very important theme, has a, uh, is very important to, to understand innovation. The difference between market making and share taking. Most of the world is made up of share takers. Most of the world is made up of share takers. How do I take one more share point from an existing market? This is the market I compete in. Here's where my current position is. What do I need to do to take one more share away from a competitor? Right? The ability to increase my market share. And most of the world is like that. Most of the world tries to identify what market do I compete in? Right? How can I take a share point away? We need more market makers, not just share takers. We need people who are going to create new markets new ways to deliver value to customers, new ways to solve the problems. We're not going to fix the large social challenges we have with share-taking mentality. We're not going to fix education with share-taking mentality. We're going to fix education with market-making mentality, thinking about new and completely different ways that we can deliver value to the student in education, to the patient in health care to the citizens in, in our communities. So very early on in my career, I learned that this notion of market making, and I have always been excited about and wanted to find ways that I can be, could be involved in market making activities. I'm not that interested in the share taking activities. And innovators are like that. They're always trying to create a completely new uh, and different way you know, to do that. I then had the opportunity uh, to, I left industry directly and I went into what I call uh, the road warrior consulting period of my life and career. Uh, I spent more years than I care to admit, well over 20, uh, as a consultant uh, working uh, for one of the larger consulting uh, firms uh, in the world, uh, what was Anderson Consulting and became Accenture. So I was a true road warrior, literally Monday through Friday, on a plane, traveling around the world, working for, over those years, probably worked with over a thousand companies uh, in the executive suite, working with CEOs and their teams, trying to help them frame very large scale change initiatives. How do we transform our company? How do we do transformational things and get from point A to point B? I have every black and blue mark that you can imagine on what it takes to hold hands with senior executives and try to help them think about what does it mean to change both themselves, the executives on the team, right, the teams and the cultures you know, within uh, that organization. For over 20 years, I never took a breath. We were so busy and we were growing so fast. I still learn today some of the things that I learned during all of that period. It was a really, really amazing time. It was the beginning uh, of the internet period, so we were beginning to think about extended enterprise, right? How do we connect outside of companies leveraging the internet? It was just the beginning uh, days uh, of that. Uh, it, I learned an awful lot you know, from that period, but one of the things that I take away from that period is all the work we did to try to help large companies change, all of it. If I have to be honest about it now, looking back on it, right, we had very limited success. Very limited success. Wrote lots of big consulting reports, right? Worked very long hours trying to convince people that they should innovate and that they should change. They should change their cultures. They should change their organizations. Uh, but the truth of it is very few of them did anything more than tweaks incremental changes. So what would set out as an initiative that would be very bold and all the rhetoric would be there from top management saying, we're going to transform this place. You know, and they would announce that to their teams and they would announce that to the company. We loved it, right? Because you know, we had been hired to do it. And you know, it was a heady time uh, for us to be working with these companies. Made a lot of money you know, doing it. But now I can look back at it and say, 
there must have been something wrong with the approach because I'm not sure we got the change that we thought we were going to get. So I knew that there had to be a better way to, to help organizations change and to think about innovation because to me, innovation was, is more about transformational things and not just about incremental or small improvements in things. So I've become very passionate uh, about what does transformation mean and how do we carve out the focus on transformational things. Not that incremental change and improvement isn't important, don't get me wrong, it, you, you have to be able to improve every day, but who is doing the transformational things and how do you make sure that that's, uh, that's part of the agenda? So anyway, fast forward, I had uh, the opportunity to retire after all those years as a road warrior consultant, and so now we were living in Rhode Island and so now all of a sudden I'm back home and it turns out that my wife wasn't that interested in having a strategy consultant at home <laughs> advising on household operations. She just wasn't in need of, of a strategy consultant. Turns out over the years she had done a super job of organizing our home uh, and making sure our kids were doing okay. And here I am at home after all those years and I'm advising on how to improve stuff, like little stupid things, like the, uh, uh, you probably all have a cupboard uh, where the cereal boxes are uh, at home. Well, we had one and with three kids, it must have had 20 half open boxes of cereal in it. I mean, I'm not kidding, 20 boxes of cereal. So I fell right into the trap you know, and said, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? I mean, there must be a different way we could organize the cereal. Do we really need 20 half open boxes? And what was going to be a year where I figured out what I was going to do next ended up being three months uh, with my wife saying, you need to go find something you know, else to do. Uh, this kind of help uh, we, don't, uh, we don't need. Uh, so I made the mistake of raising my hand to the then newly elected governor of the state of Rhode Island. You know, and I told him the story, uh, you know, here's what I've done in my career. My wife is telling me I've got to find something else to do. Uh, and he pointed towards the Economic Development Agency for the state uh, and then ultimately asked me to join his cabinet and serve as his economic development director. So that's how I became an accidental bureaucrat. I had never worked in government, never thought about working in government. Uh, but, so, but there I was. I spent six years uh, working in state government and thinking about innovation through the lens of a community, not only was an interesting thing to do in Rhode Island, it was particularly interesting. Because Rhode Island's a small, tiny place. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's the smallest state in the country. You literally can see the whole movie from the office I had. You know all the players by name. You know, there's less than two degrees of separation of everyone in the entire state. So if you're an innovation junkie like me, it's a very, very interesting place because you can see how government, the private sector companies, the colleges and universities, and all the leaders play with each other or not. And you can watch the way the, the, all the chess pieces move. So as an innovation junkie, I became very interested in, you know, hey, wait a minute. Right? If it's this small and everyone knows each other and we can connect the dots across all these public and private sector institutions, why is it that we're not an innovation platform? Why is it that we're not a laboratory where we're leading the country in creating better education solutions or better healthcare solutions or better energy solutions? I mean, hypothetically, it should be easier, right? Small state, everyone knows each other, public private sector, colleges and universities. I mean, it was all there. So we framed an economic development strategy that was centered on that. How could we make innovation and entrepreneurship cent central to our economic development future? How could we become the place where we could get below these buzzwords of public-private partnerships? And could we, in fact, turn the state into a real-world laboratory? And if we could do it, if we could do it, not only would we be delivering value to our citizens because we would be improving those social systems, but we would be a place where investors 
would be very interested in creating the next generation of solutions. Because if you could test things there and show that they work, leveraging that laboratory, right, that's a place you'd want to be, right? Because you'd want to invest in it and, and be at the cutting edge of your industry or help your company to improve. So that's where the thinking really came from. And out of that came the business innovation factory, which is the nonprofit I started. Because people started asking me, Saul, how are you going to deliver on that idea? I like it conceptually, you know, a community as a laboratory uh, for innovation and mobilizing across institutions, right, in order to position yourself as a way to deliver better value. But people started saying, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? And BIF became the answer to how we're going to do it. So we launched it as a, as a 5013C nonprofit. And it's been around seven years. And it's a community of innovation junkies that come from every imaginable silo uh, that are all going up this learning curve together on how do we activate real world laboratories to change business models and to change social systems. Uh, and we have really interesting work going on in all those places. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, later. So. so uh, I'm going to share with you some of the things that come out of all that work. Uh, there's, a, there's several things that keep me awake uh, at night. One I've already mentioned, there's always a better way. No matter what you're doing, there's a better way uh, to do it. Two, we need systems level innovation, not incremental change. We need to focus on transformation, not just constant steady tweaks or, or incremental improvement. We will not fix these social challenges until we learn how to do transformational change. If anybody thinks we're going to fix education in this country by making incremental changes to the current way we do it, I don't believe it. I, I don't know if you, if you believe it. Healthcare, the same thing. We've got to re-envision what these systems are meant to be, can be in the 21st century, learn how to use technology uh, in new and different ways uh, in, in order to do this. Another idea that keeps me up to wake, we don't try enough stuff. One of the big secrets for innovators is this idea of experimentation. I don't know where we lost this idea in this country, but somewhere along the way, we allowed big institutions to beat the idea out of us that we need to be more experimental, that we need to take ideas more rapidly you know, from our heads or from our whiteboards and get them onto the ground and try them. So this notion of experimenting all the time, right, seeing what works, failing more often, Right, but failing fast so that we can learn what works and what doesn't work, we've got to build back into our society. We become a society that doesn't experiment very much. Doesn't experiment very much. And I don't know how we're going to fix these systems unless we experiment uh, a lot more. The good news, I think, is that it's the innovator's day. I believe that in very difficult economic times like we're in right now, right, in tough, challenging times, People want to hear from innovators. We can be heard right now. They want our ideas. People are starved for new ideas. That's the good news. It's the innovator's day. The bad news is that we've turned it into a buzzword. There's no question about this. Every, everything is about innovation these days. It's everywhere. Everybody's an innovator. Everything's an innovation. And when that happens, no one's an innovator and nothing's an innovation. We have to learn how to get below the buzzword. We must get below the buzzword to talk about what does it really take to innovate and, and to change. First thing we have to do is agree on what it means. Right? If I, everywhere I go, as I start to ask people to define innovation for me, however many people are in the room, I get more answers back that are different than there are people in the room. So how can we ever create a common agenda around innovation when we don't all agree on what we mean uh, by innovation? Uh, I offer up a simple definition, you know, at least for our discussions today. To me, to me, innovation is nothing more than a better way to deliver value. Innovation is a better way to deliver value. The key in that definition is deliver value. To me, it's not an innovation until it actually delivers. 
It's not an innovation until it solves the problem. It's not an innovation until it's in the hands of people in the real world, right? Before that, it's an idea. Before that, it's an invention you know, that sits in a laboratory or something that sits on a whiteboard. To me, innovation is about delivering. You have to actually do it, right? You have to solve the problem for it to be an innovation. It's very different than invention. In this country, you know, and sometimes I see around the world, we've conflated these two ideas. We think about invention and innovation as being the same right, in our conversations. And they're not. They're not the same. I mean, I love invention. I mean, I'm glad that we have a culture that, that celebrates famous inventors and that we invest heavily in creating new technologies and invention. But let's be honest. Let's be honest about it. We have more invention, we have more technology than we know how to use as humans. Say that again. We have more technology than we know how to use. Our challenge in fixing those social challenges we have isn't that we don't have the right technologies. We got tons of technology, right? We can't absorb and use the technologies we already have. The problem isn't the technology. The problem is us, it's humans. It's humans and the organizations we live in. We're resistant to change. We don't like change. We don't like to experiment. We like safety. Organizations we live in work in like predictability. Right? These are all the things that are getting in the way of fixing some of the challenges that we have uh, and, and to innovating. You have to separate out invention and innovation in a conversation because if you don't, when you're talking to somebody about innovation, what's going on in their heads is invention, a better mousetrap. That's what's going on in their head, that we can fix these problems if we only could create the next best mousetrap. Right? And that's not what innovation is about. Most of the time, it's about not inventing anything new at all. Most of the time, it's just about combining the parts in different ways and figuring out new ways to use what we already have, but having the flexibility to combine them in different ways to solve the problem. And what's getting in our way from solving the problems is our inability to play with the parts, because the parts are all locked up in organizations that are constraining our ability to play with them, like Tinker Toys. And that's all innovation really is. You know, it's not anything fancier than that. Right? It's a very simple idea, but it's easier to say than it is to do because the parts that we need to play with are controlled by and influenced by people who won't let us play with them to solve the problem. I mean, if we spent the rest of this afternoon you know, in these breakout rooms, we could doodle on the board solutions to all these problems we're talking about today. Right? You guys have all the ideas on how to fix these problems. That's not the problem. We're not short of ideas. What we're short of is how to take the ideas, get them into the real world, and to demonstrate that they can work. And that's really the innovation you know, challenge. So I'm going to share one, I can't resist at least one matrix you know, as a recovering consultant uh, to, to make my point. And the reason why I think business model innovation is so very important you know, to, to solving these challenges uh, that we have. Uh, if, if you look at that chart, what I've got is on the y-axis going up and down, I have product innovation. And on the x-axis coming across, I have business model innovation or capabilities. So here's what happens when you go into organizations and you talk about innovation. The first thing that they talk about, always, is the y-axis. They talk about better mousetraps, products, right? Innovation to us means inventing new products, creating new products, creating new revenue by adding products to our mix. And in many organizations, that's all they ever talk about. They never get beyond the pro uh, talking about product. Uh, we just need better mousetraps. And we can sustain our position in the marketplace if we just keep coming up with better products, right? Over and over and over and over and over again. On the x-axis coming across, it's about capabilities. Capabilities, in my, uh, my definition of capabilities are very simple. Just the ability to do something, the power to do something. What can your organization do? Now, most organizations that I work with, the very first thing they hand me when I talk to them about, about the x-axis is they hand me their org charts. Here's our, here's, here are our capabilities. And they show me an org chart. I don't want an org chart. 
An org chart doesn't tell me what the capabilities are. It doesn't tell me what an organization can do. What I want is a list of what you can do and a prioritized list of these are the things that are most important for me to do. Right? And most organizations can't hand me that. All they can hand me, they rip them out of the binder, is an org chart and show me who reports to who, and this one reports to that one. And then, right? So in, you, if you want to talk about innovation, you've got, to get, you've got to get rid of the org chart, and you've got to talk about capabilities. What can the organization do? Now, some organizations will go beyond the product dimension and they'll innovate on the capability dimension. So how do I improve my capabilities? How do I do a better job of, of manufacturing and distributing my products? How do I do a better job of connecting with and communicating with my customers? You know, all the things that organizations you know, typically do. And they'll innovate on that dimension by improving their capability set. But the overwhelming majority of companies that I have seen over the years will, will create incremental improvements to the way they currently deliver value. That's what they'll do. The innovation conversation starts and it stops with what new products can I put into the marketplace and how can I improve my current capability set to deliver value to my customers. And that's the innovation agenda and it ends. And what doesn't happen is what's the next business model? Maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a different way to deliver value. I'm a college. Maybe there's a different way to deliver education you know, to, to our students. Maybe there's a different way to deliver education to more students than the way we do it today. You know, whatever the business is, whatever the government agency is, it's always the same. Right? What's the current business model? How do I deliver value to my customers? And how do, the innovation conversation is about how do I improve that? That's important. All organizations should do that. The piece that's missing, and I think the piece that's imperative as we go forward, is to add to that agenda R&D for new business models. What's the next business model? Right? Because if you don't do it, someone's going to do it to you. Someone's going to figure out what that new business model is, and they're going to disrupt you. So if you're a college and all you're thinking about is the current model for delivering you know, education to your students, I mean, you know this already. Someone else is sitting over here saying, I don't need all that bricks and mortar. You know, I don't need that pretty campus. You know, I can deliver education to students, and I can get them access to the best teaching in the world right, through the web. Right? And everyone back in the college says, yeah, yeah, that'll never work. You know, that won't happen. That, that won't disrupt us. There's always going to be a demand you know, for what we deliver today. Well, I don't care what your business model is. Right? It used to be that a business model lasted forever. It used to be. In the industrial era, business models never, ever changed, ever. They just they didn't change. What, in the 21st century, the half-life of a business model is declining, and they are going to change much, much more rapidly. CEOs never had to change their business model. Therefore, they didn't teach it in business school. Therefore, every CEO's colleagues didn't do it. They don't know how to do it. The CEO of tomorrow will have to change his or her business model two or three times over the course of their career. That is huge. That is huge to learn how to change your business model. And we better learn how to do it. So here's how I define business model. I asked you an unfair question when I started. Tell me what your business model is. And I didn't give you a definition to use. So, so here's a definition you can use as you think about that question. A business model is really just the way you link together capabilities, those, those things that you have the ability to do. I mean, how do you link them together right, to deliver value to a customer? And what's the financial model that you use to do it. So a shorter version of that is a business model is about how you create, deliver, and capture value. Business model is how you create, deliver, and capture value. And all business models have those three components. And every organization has a business model. It doesn't have to be a for-profit business. Every university has a business model. Every government agency has a business model. I believe even individuals have business models. How do you create, deliver, and capture value in order to sustain yourself and, and stay relevant uh, in, the, in the 21st uh, century? Here's a picture of that. I won't, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but the, over on the left-hand side are the capabilities. 
So you list the things that the organization has the power to do. On the right-hand side, you talk about what value you're trying to deliver to what customer. And on the bottom, it's how you capture. So how do you create, deliver, and capture value? And so business model innovation is just how do we accelerate the pace of this? So business model innovation is about how do you change your business model? And this is really tricky because while you're pedaling the bicycle of your current business model, which is hard work, it's hard work running a, any business. People are working incredibly hard to do what they do every single day. So how do you carve out the capacity for thinking about the next business model. And that's my notion of R&D for new business models, that you've got to build in the capability to think about experimentation of, of new business models. There are a number of factors that lead me to believe that, that every leader is going to have to learn how to do this. A number of factors, and you know them, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. But this has been going on for some time now. Globalization, you know, has forced this. Enabling technology, you know, has, has forced it. This idea of going from chains to networks. I mean, I'm a dinosaur, so I grew up in a world that was linked in a chain form. You do this, then you do that, then you do that. Uh, organizations were hierarchical. You, know, you, uh, you report to this person, reports to that person, reports to that person, and everything was linked in a chain. Well, those of you, and there's a lot of students in the room today, you know the world doesn't work that way anymore. It's not about chains, it's about networks. Everything connects to everything else, right? It's, it's not about sequential anymore. It's about iterative. It's about what nodes on the network do I need to link to you know, to get the answer that I want? What nodes on the network do I need to link to in order to change the way we deliver value to a customer? But yet all our organizations are still back in that chain world, aren't they? Right? They're still in that model of, of chains. They're not in the network model. But yet we know we're in, a, we're in a world right now that's all about networks. Something has to give. Something has to give because in the end, business model innovation is just about playing with the parts and creating new networks and ways to deliver value to the customer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a quick series of, because uh, I want you to hear some other voices of people that are doing this. So I'm going to show you a series of, of people that are doing this. And I think I'll surprise you uh, with some of, the, some of the video clips I'm going to show you. Because I believe that people that are really good at business model innovation aren't just business people. They're not just business people, that we have to look outside of our silos to think about people that are changing the way that they create, deliver, and package value. First one is a business person. Uh, how many people know Tony Shea and what's going on at Zappos? Come on, you haven't ordered shoes from Zappos? Come on, who hasn't ordered shoes from Zappos? When I first met Tony, I've met him several times now. I did not, I had not heard of Zappos. This goes back uh, a bunch of years. And I went home uh, and I told my family, I have three kids, two daughters, uh, and I said, I met this really cool guy, Tony Shea, and he runs some company called Zappos. And my daughters looked at me like, are you kidding me? Have you haven't seen all those Zappos boxes you know, that have been coming into this house for me? <laughs> like, I completely missed it. Let me, uh, uh, let's listen to Tony for a couple of minutes. So most people, when they hear Zappos, know us for shoes. Right now, we have roughly about 9 million customers, which is paying customers, which is about 3% of the US population. But really, internally, we think of our company pretty differently. We really want the Zappos brand to be just about the very best customer service and the very best customer experience. And in fact, today, we're actually selling a lot more than just shoes. We sell clothing and handbags, even electronics and cookware. And our hope is that 10 years from now, hopefully people won't even realize that we started out selling shoes online. And they just know the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And we've even had customers email us and ask us, will we please start an airline or run the IRS? <laughs> and so um, we're not going to do that this year. but. <laughs> 30 years from now, I wouldn't rule out a Zappos Airlines. That's just about the very best customer service. So one brand we kind of look for, towards for inspiration is Virgin. Virgin does music. They do airlines and a whole bunch of other things. And the difference is that the Virgin brand is more about being hip and cool. We just want to be about the very best customer service and experience. So on the customer service side, there's a whole bunch of things 
that we do. You know, it's free shipping both ways. We do a surprise upgrade to most of our customers. Uh, we promise they'll get their shoes in four or five business days, but most of them, they actually get a surprise upgrade to overnight shipping. And because we run our warehouse 24 seven, which actually is not the most efficient way to, to run a warehouse, the most efficient way is for the orders to pile up and then you have higher picking, picking density uh, and, and so on. And, but because we run it 24 seven, a lot of customers order as late as midnight Eastern and then it's on their doorstep eight hours later. And that just creates that wow experience, that emotional uh, experience for the customer. And it causes them to remember Zappos specifically and really drives the repeat customers. They purchase from us more often. They spend more money with us. And probably most importantly, they tell their friends about us. And that's really how we've grown over the past nine years. The number one driver of our growth has been from repeat customers and word of mouth. If customers call our, we call it our customer loyalty team, which is our name for our call center. Uh, well, first of all, they can call us. Most websites, it's pretty hard to find contact information for customer service. It's, if it's there at all, it's five clicks deep and you have to really look for it. We kind of take the complete opposite approach where we'll put our 1-800 number on the top of every single page of our website because we actually want to talk to our customers. And we don't have scripts, we don't upsell, and uh, every rep is actually trained so that if a customer is looking for a specific pair of shoes, and let's say we're out of stock of their size, to look on at least three other websites, and if they find the shoe on another website, to direct the customer to the other website. And the whole philosophy is we're not interested in trying to maximize any individual transaction. What we're trying to do is build a lifelong relationship with the customer and make that relationship as personal as possible. So our guide to our reps is, you know, don't worry about scripts, just be yourself and make sure that you go above and beyond for the customer. So, so Tony's changed every aspect of the, of, his, of the business model and it's a completely different business model than uh, any company like it. And if you ever get the opportunity, if you're ever in Las Vegas uh, and Tony welcomes people to come do it, if you ever get to visit Zappos, it's the most amazing experience that you've ever had. The, it's really remarkable to go in there and to see the way people are committed to executing the business model that he describes there. It completely differentiates uh, what he's doing from uh, almost any other online retailer uh, that I know. It's a pretty remarkable uh, story. Now, I'm going to share a couple of other videos from a completely different you know, perspective uh, because I want to drive home the point that the way we learn about innovation and where we get our ideas from has to be outside of our normal silos. We, the best ideas are in the gray areas between us. And some of the most innovative people I know come from almost every imaginable part of our society, but we don't look there because we tend to only look you know, within our silo and interact with the people that we normally would interact with. All of these video clips come from, we run a summit every year where we bring all these unusual suspects together uh, and we celebrate these innovation stories in a, in a theater full of, of like-minded innovation junkies. This is a dear friend of mine who's a police chief. Now, who would have ever thought a police chief would, uh, would, be, would be stood up as uh, a business model innovator? Dean Esserman is probably one of the best business model innovators uh, that I know. Could you imagine that you are uh, traumatized physically, you're rushed in an ambulance, some terrible injury, and as you get out of the ambulance and rushed into the emergency room, it's the first time in your life you've met your family doctor. You say there's something wrong with that. You're supposed to have a relationship. It's supposed to build over the years. You're supposed to get to know one another. But in American policing, that's how it's supposed to be. We're anonymous and distant, and you don't know who you are, we are until you meet us that day in a crisis, and then you know our number if we haven't switched it on there. And our name if we happen to be wearing our name tag that day, or if we're playing a game by wearing our partners that day. And that's it. And it's a one-way relationship. You talk and we receive, 
and then we give you a call if we can sometime later. And America's accepted that. Um, we're in the midst in our business of a uh, quiet revolution where we're really changing the way we do business, where we are thinking about becoming a different type of police force, not abandoning 911. We still answer that phone. We still got lots of police cars. Uh, but a department now that has moved into the neighborhoods of the community that uh, has uh, become part of the community again, instead of prodding itself and being apart from it. That if you walk our streets and you go into restaurants and stores and anybody around this city, there's a pretty good chance you're going to see a police officer's business card taped to the cash register or on the, on the back pegboard with the officer's cell phone because uh, you know who, you're beginning to know who we are again, that the face of the Providence Police Department, as my wife says, thank God is not this one, <laughs> but is the officers in the neighborhoods again. Um, Crimes down five years in a row in Providence. Only city in New England. Only one of a handful of cities in the nation. We will bury less children in the last few years than we have in a generation in this city. Crime is down to what it was in the 1970s here. Dean held a every Tuesday morning meeting with all of the commanders. And he changed the business model from, as he said, you know, this centralized, deployed, you call 911 and we'll come business model, to creating substations all around the community. And he moved all the folks out to the communities. And they resisted like you can't imagine, you know, what, what it was like. And when you go to his Tuesday morning staff meeting, he has an information system that's better than most businesses I've ever been in, where they display information that tells you what's going on in each of those communities and what's happened, and they can tailor their approach. It's better than most businesses can respond to the information from their business. You can learn a lot from finding business model innovators that are in unusual places. You just have to be open to learning from their stories. This next story, uh, another friend of mine, uh, you may know of him, his name is Bob Ballard. Uh, this is the guy who found the Titanic. Uh, and uh, he completely, completely changed uh, the way we do uh, ocean exploration. And he's one of the most inspiring innovators uh, that I know. Go ahead. Submarines are antiquated pieces of technology because the average depth of the ocean, average depth, is 12,000 feet. 50% of the world's oceans is deeper than 12,000 feet. So it's going to take you, you know, it gets down to seven miles. But just to make an average dive, which I had been doing for decades in this thing, okay, was taking me two and a half hours to get to work in the morning, and two and a half hours to get home. And I had a five-hour commute. I know you must take the train into New York. Try a five-hour commute in a freezing elevator with no bathroom, okay? <laughs> And, you know, and, 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 and if you're lucky, on a dive, the full day, you get one mile. Now, we're, on, we're trying to explore 72% of the planet in total pitch blackness. Well, we work, work in a total world of complete darkness. And what's really interesting about this is, is it's like the space program in that when you take this land, air-breathing creature and you put him in another environment that's hostile, we have to get creative. And innovation really is interesting when you're stuck with, you know, people say, what's it like to explore the biggest mountain range on Earth? And they say, well, it's like going to the Rocky Mountains at night in a snowstorm in a helicopter with a flashlight, you know. <laughs> it, it's just, it, you can't see a damn thing. And so you have to be very, very creative. But one of the problems we also had was we were just not getting much done. And I went to Stanford, I was teaching Stan uh, geophysics at Stanford in 1980, and I heard about fiber optics. And I, they started explaining to me, you know, we're going to get rid of electrons, we're going to use photons, we'll get rid of you know, precious metal like copper and use sand, beach sand. 
and we'll be able to move a tremendous amount of information and bandwidth will expand orders of magnitude. And I said, this is cool because I could get around this whole problem that we've been having and create a telepresence. See, the idea was, you know, you're really not, when you get down on the submarine, you don't get out. It's not like, you know, <laughs> you know, Leo Armstrong, they finally, did you hear the yesterday in the New York Times, they found the A? The missing A. I don't know where they did. I don't know where he had it somewhere. I don't know, but uh, the missing A. That's another story. But anyway, uh, the whole, you don't get out of the submarine. You know, if you do, it's a, you know, it's a bad day. Uh, so why am I going down there? I mean, if, if I'm looking out of a little, you know, a lot of times you know, people think this is grand view. You get these IMAX shows of the submarine. We don't see that underwater. It's like a peephole in a door in the in the hotel. You know, had anyone there? You know, that's the ocean. Okay. The idea to be able to have this panoramic vision and have it 24 hours a day. So I went, I published a cartoon like this in, in National Geographic in 1981. How many of you were alive in, in 1981? The whole idea, you know, you and I were, were still here, uh, was to create a robot that had everything my submarine had except my body. That was the idea to create a telepresence, to create a, a, a studio up on the deck of the ship. And when I turned it on and I turned on everything, I thought I was inside the submarine. That was, the, that was, the, that was the, the concept. The beauty of it is if I could have this out-of-body experience, if I could pull it off, it's like a you know, beam me down Scotty kind of thing, I could use a satellite and create the telepresence anywhere I wanted to. And this is the beginning of electronic travel, because that's where we're headed, electronic travel. Bob's taught me a lot about innovation. He, uh, he, he, he has uh, an office at the Mystic Seaport Aquarium in Connecticut. And when I go to visit him there, he has an entire wall that is a map of the ocean floor. And when I meet with him, we go sit, literally, right in front of the wall. We just sit in front of the wall. And Bob talks about the ocean floor and all the unexplored places that we have yet to go. Uh, and he is one of the most inspiring innovators that I have ever, ever met. And I love when he asks the question, why do we go there? Like, why, you know, why would we go to the bottom of the ocean if we had technology that would enable us to do it in a different way? Well, why do we do the things that we do? Why do people in our organizations do the things that they do when you scratch your head you know, and say, there's a different way to do that, right? We could use technology in a different way, but we still go. We still go to the bottom of the ocean, peek out of the little hole that Bob talks about. I don't know why we do it. We do it because that's the way we always did it, right? Until somebody like Bob comes along and says, you know what? You know, we could do this in a very, very different way, right? We've had a lot of business people uh, at our summit that we've exposed to stories like the ones I'm sharing with you now, uh, and the light bulb goes off that I have to stop listening to people, only listening to the people that are in my industry that are like me, that are talking about the same thing they've been talking about you know, for 100 years, so I make sure that I don't miss something. Right, and start listening to people that come from completely different areas that can share with you how they did things differently and how they broke through you know, some of these things. Last video uh, I want to share with you uh, is uh, uh, another dear friend of mine, uh, Dennis Litke, uh, who uh, is uh, one of the uh, most amazing innovators in the education space. Uh, I serve on the board of the Big Picture Company, uh, which has built these schools he's going to tell you about across uh, the country. Uh, again, just an amazing business model innovator, completely changing the way we think about education. And uh, excuse the language uh, in this tape, but he's, uh, he's such a good innovator, I feel obligated to, to share it with you. Go ahead. Basically, um, there was a giant survey done of all high school students in this country, and they asked them to come up with one word that describes their high school. What do you think the word was? Boring. boring. Sad we know it, too. <laughs> you know? And our school is not boring. And, and Ellie and I were committed to have an engaged place, to just look at the student, find their interest and passion, find adults out in the community, connect them up to those adults every Tuesday and Thursday. And when they're back at school Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, do the English. We don't have regular classes. We do the English, the science, the math, all integrated there. They have the, the access to go because it's their own schedule. Everyone's got their own plan. 
um, to go out to college classes. So it just makes sense. It's how you learn in the world. Um, you don't learn by 45 minutes in a class, ring a bell, go to another class, ring a bell. Uh, you don't learn that way. So. Um, we started and everyone kind of laughed at us in 95. Um, like, what are they doing? No classes, huh, huh? Just like Melvin, oh, three days a week. I like that, man. Um, and then what happened? They started looking at our attendance. 97% attendance. The rest of the city had 77%. Mm. Then they started looking at dropout. 2% of our kids were dropping out. The city was 46%. So they stopped laughing a little bit. Then it became senior year. Every one of our kids got accepted to college with good bucks going. And then they went, whoa. And that's when uh, uh, young Bill Gates, old Bill Gates, uh, sent his top education man down to see us, Tom Vander Ark. And I had a good history in, in the past, uh, except my firings, um, <laughs> of running schools. And he came down, and he's talking to Elliot and I. This is just when they started getting into education, year 2000, talking to Elliot and I. And then the guy was smart enough to say, you guys are BSing me. Um, that's nice. I like it. But let me go talk to the kids. And said it was at noon, and I'm going into the cafeteria. And we were in the Shepherd Building. There were all kinds of other people in the cafeteria. And then I think, oh my gosh, I had this one girl, Susan, who actually, the reason she came to our school was to organize the Latino girls. She thought the school was small enough. And every day in the cafeteria, she'd say, fuck, like five times. I already warned them I was going to say this. Man. Uh, they've heard the word before. They taught me, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, and I go, oh my gosh, this is what the head of Gates is coming in. And then I think Susan was absent that day. And I go, yes, yes, what a day. And, and Tom was in there for an hour, came out and said, I'm amazed. I pushed your students hard. Here's $5 million. Give me 12 schools around the country. And we did that. And uh, we could pick wherever we wanted. We picked nice, pretty places where our friends were. Um, and, and then he came back and said, give me 40 more, gave us another $15 million. We now have today 72 schools around the country to follow this philosophy. Um, we can learn from people that are innovating uh, in all walks of life and that there are lots of great examples of people that have completely shifted or changed their business model. In fact, the best ideas for how we can change whatever business we're in is by learning from folks like that and looking for ways to, to connect the dots horizontally. I'm going to go through just a few more slides very quickly and then I want to open it up and uh, hear, hear what's on uh, your mind. So I think the question is how do we make business model innovation more predictable and easier to manage? You know, how do we do that? I think it's been underestimated as a source of competitive advantage. Most leaders uh, are, are focused mainly on stay focused on the knitting, improve the current business model, and don't worry about whether they, they need to create a different one because they figure that the current one will last through his or her whole career. It won't. Right? You're going to get disrupted. You have to figure out uh, how to do uh, R&D. Um, I think that the business model innovation, uh, it's, it's been underestimated how hard it is to do. If I, when I travel into most organizations, I see what I call death by a thousand initiatives. Right? Literally, if you map uh, what organizations are doing, all well-intentioned, but you literally go through it. There's a thousand projects, some of which are explicit, you know, some of which are implicit you know, or skunk works, none of which talk to one another, and all of them are just going to do improvements of the current business model. None of them are going to change the, the business model uh, at all. I think this is changing. I think leaders are starting uh, to get it. Lots of research has been done you know, indicating that CEOs will say, now they, I, need to change, I need to figure out how to change my business model. So they know it's important, but they don't know how to do it. They don't have the tools uh, to do it, and they didn't learn uh, how to do it. So my idea is that we need to create the conditions to do it. We need to find platforms and environments where we can experiment. While we're pedaling the bicycle of the current business model, where can we take ideas off of the whiteboard, get them onto the real world ground, and begin to test them, begin to try more stuff. So that's what we've created uh, at the Business Innovation Factory. You know, we've got a series of what we call experience labs, one in education, one in healthcare, one in energy, and one in entrepreneurship. We have innovators from around the country uh, that are rolling up their sleeves, 
right, and trying to get ideas into the real world to change how we deliver value in those social spaces. We're trying to go up the learning curve together on how you do R&D for new business models. You have uh, a, a sheet there uh, that was uh, on your seat when you came in. I'm not going to go through these, but I wanted you to have this. This is what we call uh, the BIF genome. This is after all the years of doing this work, this is what we think the characteristics are of business model innovators and organizations and communities that are prepared you know, to do business model innovation. Uh, and I'll just talk about the top line. I won't go through all the elements in the genome, uh, but I thought it would be interesting for you to have those and to begin to think about uh, whether or not those resonate with you, whether the organizations that you're a, a part of uh, have these characteristics you know, to, to be able to do this work. We hang it on what we call connect, inspire, transform. Connect because it's a team sport, right? You can't do it alone. You can't do it without connecting and collaborating and learning from unusual suspects and, and connecting to unusual suspects. Inspiration is key. People do what they're passionate about. People, they use stories to, to create emotional connections. They get passionate people to follow, and it goes back to when I, the way I started around being a catalyst and then getting out of the way by unleashing the passion within organizations as opposed to top-down dictating the way organizations work and change. And then uh, lastly, transformation is about the kind of change that you heard in those videos, not about making small or incremental improvements. It's about experimenting with completely new ways to, to create, deliver, and capture value. I'm going to end my comments uh, there and open it up uh, to, to conversation. I hope I at least stimulated some thought uh, about the importance of not just innovation, but business model innovation. Uh, I hope that I shared some ideas with you uh, that are relevant to you as individuals, to your organizations, uh, and to your community as you think about how to build more innovation capacity uh, here in Cleveland uh, and in your organizations. And I appreciate uh, your patience in listening to uh, my diatribe, uh, and I'd love to interact and to hear your thoughts, and uh, happy to respond to any questions. Not so much a, a question, but a comment. Yeah. Uh, with all four of those videos that you showed, I found it very interesting that not only were they talking about their business model, but their core purpose of their yeah. organizations was yeah. incredibly clear. Yeah. I mean, it's something you could almost translate into a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great observation, and it's so true, right? That that real innovators, in order to unleash the passion that we're talking about, have a very clear point of view about how we deliver value. There's a, a quote I would share with you. Uh, one of uh, uh, our, my mentors is a guy by the name of Roger Martin uh, up in Toronto, uh, who's a really great thinker on this subject. And in a conversation he told me, uh, which really stuck with me, uh, he said, innovators are, are people that have a very strong and clear point of view. All innovators have that. But they know they're missing something. And I love the but, right? Because we all know innovators have a strong point of view. But they know they're missing something. They're self-aware enough to know that they don't have the whole answer, that they have to put their ideas out there, that they have to be vulnerable, right? That they have to allow people to share different approaches and ideas with them so that their idea can get better. They don't know what they're missing, but they know they're missing something. And I think that's a really important part of the innovation conversation. Good observation. Thank you. So one of my questions is, um, being a type A personality, I don't like to fail. Yep. But also, there's yep. external consequences for failing. So how do yep. I sell the return on an investment for risk of failure? Great, great, great question. Uh, and uh, a lot of, of, of public discourse on that. You know, this whole idea of if we're going to be more entrepreneurial, you know, and we're going to uh, be more about innovation, we ha and we're going to have to learn how to fail, fail more. And we're not good at it. We're not good at it. You're absolutely right. But none of us you know, like to fail. We've got a society that reinforces that and organizations you know, that reinforce that. I like to think about the uh, failure. Uh, I'd like to reframe it as intentional iteration. 
right? Because I think failure has this connotation that makes it very difficult you know, to get over. But if you frame it as intentional iteration, meaning I'm going to try lots of stuff. I just am. And of course, they're not all going to work. That's OK, right? But we're going we're gonna to do, do it fast, right? And we're going to experiment with lots of things. And we're going to figure out what works. And we're going to build on what works helps to get over that. I still have all of the outside influences, right, that are constantly reinforcing this idea you know, that I can't fail. What we have to start doing as a group of innovators is reinforcing the idea that it's not about failure, it's about trying. It's about intentional iteration and reinforcing the behaviors uh, around that. Because that's the only way we're going to get there. Because until we fix that, until we create environments that it's OK to try more stuff, and we don't expect everything's going to work. But what we do expect is that you're going to learn all the time, that everything you do, you're going to learn from, and that you're going to leverage one activity to the next activity to the next activity. This is true in terms of personal development and careers, right? right? I, I don't know very many people who end up doing what they said they were going to do you know, when they got out of school. I just don't. I mean, most of the people I know, you know, and I, I always ask people this, you know, tell me what you thought you were going to do, you know, and tell me what you're doing now. It's almost always, always different, right? And most people go through a path, you know, like this. But yet, why do we have this notion that I have to know the answer to that, you know, when I get out of college? I mean, that's not what I tell my kids, right? You have no clue what you're going to do. I don't care what you do. Just do something interesting, learn from it, and leverage it to the next thing you're going to do. And then you'll figure out how to find your passion and what you're good at. And if you, if you got out of your education the ability to be a lifelong learner you know, and, and just an incredibly curious person, and you're willing to experiment and try more stuff, you're going to be great. I totally, I totally believe that. Uh, and I just think that's true. And we should be reinforcing that more uh, is the only way I, you know, I can answer that. That's, but you're absolutely right. So if you go back to early in the presentation, you talked about your time as a consultant. Yep. And you worked with hundreds of companies and yep. CEOs. And they were all looking for big change, transformational yeah. change. Yeah. And you said typically was not successful. Yep. Why? Like, what's the? Yeah. Com I'm sure there's hundreds of reasons why. Yeah. But what's the common reason that folks weren't successful? Yeah, I think the the main reason that it wasn't successful is because it goes to to my dialogue on business models. We work in an existing business model, and everyone who lives in that business model, right? Everyone, top to bottom, right, is wired to live and work in that business model. So I can say all I want that I want to do transformational things. But everyone in the business model is incented to make the current business model work. Right? Here's the results I need to produce from, from our current business model. And so until I create the conditions and allow for doing things differently, I'm not, things aren't going to be done differently. So you can, the rhetoric that sits on top of you know, the executive saying, and I want you to consider transformational things you know, and you know, all the lofty language that says to do it, when it gets back down into the organization, all of the line executives in that organization are incented and focused on how to improve what they're doing. So they see the world through the lens of how do we do this better? How can this initiative help us do what we do today better. And I don't mean to imply that that's a bad thing. I mean, you should improve your current business model. I, I don't have any problem with that. All I'm saying is that where's the agenda that says, while we're doing that, over here, I want to commission an initiative that isn't about improving the current business model. It's about re-envisioning what the business model could and should be. And the really great leaders would say, it's OK if it disrupts us. So I use the example, uh, I often use the example of blockbusters and Netflix. So you're a blockbuster, and you're going gang, you know, gangbusters. You're owning this whole video rental you know, marketplace, uh, growing like a weed, opening up new stores all over the place. Everybody in the organization is focused on how to grow the blockbusters network. More stores, more videos and DVDs you know, being moved through those stores. And it's working, and it's growing, and the shareholder you know, value is, is growing. Now, you can't convince me that the executives in blockbusters 
didn't see the technology coming that was, would allow us to move movies digitally through a different channel, a different business model, a different way to deliver value. Of course they saw it coming. They knew it was coming, they saw it. But they were so focused on the current business model that they did everything they could do to either A, ignore it, minimize it, prevent it, all the things that people in a business model do, right? Because why? They're trying to sustain the current business model. So what happens? Netflix happens, right? Of course Netflix happens. I mean, it's very predictable. We all saw the technology coming, and Netflix capitalized on a different business model to deliver content to us. And the beauty of that story is, to my point about you have to be experimenting all the time, now we're in the throes of watching Netflix go through the same thing. Right, so Netflix now has its business model, and here's what it does. And the red envelopes come in the mail, and we built up a whole business model to send those red envelopes you know, to all of our homes. And then all of a sudden we say, no surprise to anybody, maybe I can distribute that digital content without having to send the disk directly you know, through a broadband connection. And now Netflix is sitting there saying, now what do I do? Right? And there's all kinds of interesting things to talk about about that. The point is that the business model continues to work, and my perspective is that you should be experimenting with the next business model. So what Blockbuster should have done is it should have had a lab for new business models over here where the CEO said, pay no attention to what's going on over here. What I want you to do is figure out where the next technology is going to go and figure out if there's a, a new and different business model and way to distribute it so that we could figure out how that is going to work. Whether we were going to absorb it back into the core, establish Netflix ourselves. You know, they had a chance to actually, you know, partner with Netflix you know, early on. You know, they, the Netflix team literally went down to Texas, met with the Blockbusters team, and early on offered it to them. Let's partner. You have all the resources. You have the distribution. We'll be the, you know, it will be, we'll have this distribution channel. You'll have that. And the folks at Blockbusters laughed at them, laughed at them, and then got disrupted by them. And now the folks from Netflix, you know, are being disrupted, you know, and it's changing. It's an ongoing cycle. My view is this, that, that this is going to go happen faster and that if you're Blockbusters, you better be figuring out what the Netflix model is. And if you're Netflix, you better be figuring out what the next business model is. You've got to be experimenting all the time or you're going to get disrupted. It's easier to say than it is to do, but if you don't figure out how to do it, you're going to get disrupted, regardless of whether you're a business, a college, a government agency, or not. Thank you.